about uh, chapter 14, Instructional Excellence, How to Be a Better Teacher. Instructional excellence begins with a solid educational plan. Educational plans create a framework connecting all other instructional uh, elements. In the months of, uh, preceding the school year, teachers reflect on their personal goals and instructional style and how these will affect their educational planning. Many factors influence this process, including state and federal mandates, individual value systems, as well as community values. Planning for instruction involves several steps. The first, first uh, the teachers go through a process where they attempt to define what they want their students to learn. It is forward thinking and involves a process of, of envisioning the future. Second, teachers develop specific goals and objectives for making these learning outcomes a reality. They must develop rigorous instructional requirements and appropriate activities to guide students toward their educational goals. Finally, the teacher addresses testing and evaluation options. Assessments have historically been an integral part of the educational process. They both direct and document learning. Making decisions about what to teach and how to teach it are no longer under the exclusive province of the individual teacher. Beginning uh, teachers are often struck by how much of their lesson plans are dictated by standards from a variety of sources. A variety of local, state, federal, and societal factors shape what schools teach today. American society has expectations regarding what the, uh, they believe students should learn. Society wants future generations to be able to read fluidly, perform mathematical operations, understand history and the humanities, appreciate the scientific process and the arts, and understand the value of their role as citizens. These are difficult to, to objectively define, but they still provide direction for the federal government and individual states when developing specific plans and goals. Historically, states have taken a more general and removed approach uh, to influencing curricular uh, development. Today, states are taking a more active role. The broad expectations of society need to be translated into actionable items schools and teachers can follow. They need to be modified into specific goals and objectives teachers can use to develop appropriate curriculum. As a check on this process, schools must demonstrate to the federal government that they are making adequate yearly progress toward their goals. The specific techniques for establishing progress are state-determined and often take the form of statewide tests. State-level concerns are not the only concerns schools need to consider when establishing curricular plans. Local communities are also influential uh, in establishing what goals are valued. Step into any school district in the nation and it becomes clear what educational factors are prioritized. Some value certain subjects over others. Uh, these local value systems also play an important role in what schools teach. They are the values that are closest to the hearts of the actual community members and are often viewed as the most important. The process of planning and setting educational goals has a direct bearing on the academic subjects emphasized in school. Current national goals focus on reading and math skills causing a corresponding shift in educational practice. In 1991, a national survey of teachers in grades 1 through 4 found that 33% of instructional time was spent on reading. By, 20, uh, by 2004, this had increased to 36%. Math instruction similarly increased from 15% to 17%. Over the same period of time, social studies instruction decreased from 9% to 8%, and science instruction from 8% to 7%. 
Our goals for reading and math are causing a shift away from learning in other subject areas. Understandably, there are only so many hours in the school day and priorities must be set. However, it is always important to weigh the impact of the curricular changes. It is important to help the youth of America develop strengths in reading and math, but it is also important to foster their development as citizens and their appreciation of the social sciences, natural sciences, the arts, and physical education. Benjamin Bloom and his colleagues were interested in taking the multitude of things that an educator could teach and develop a system for categorizing them into obje objectives. Each objective would be part of a particular overall domain that would translate into specific instructional activities. His system became known as Bloom's Taxonomies of Educational Objectives. He developed objectives along three dimensions cognitive, psychomotor, and affective. Bloom's taxonomy is a co comprehensive list of cognitive, psychomotor, and effect, affective domain objectives. To use the table uh, to write an objective, a teacher decides what kind of knowledge to emphasize and how the student should approach learning the material. A student is given an assignment to write an essay supporting a political point of view. After completing the essay, the student is required to provide a critique of their work. Critiquing is one of the cognitive skills associated with evaluating. What they are required to critique is their own thought process. This results in the intersection of the cognitive process dimension of evaluating with the knowledge dimension of metacognitive knowledge. Teachers can <clears throat> develop educational objectives in a variety of areas. Emotional areas focus on helping the student demonstrate appropriate levels of emotionality and commitment. Psychomotor areas include fine motor skills useful in handwriting and manipulating objectives, objects, and large motor skills emphasized in physical education. The importance of Bloom's work is that he gives teachers a wealth of domain areas from which they can ch choose to develop instructional objectives. The specific nature of those lessons will be influenced by federal, state, community, and personal values. A reasonable balance between domain areas helps students succeed across a wide range of academic, social, and occupational areas. Instructional planning is critical for educational success. Planning involves developing development of uh, clear goals and objectives. These are shaped by a variety of factors, including societal, federal, state, community, and, of course, the teacher. Development of the instructional plan is only a part of the educational process. Even the most well-developed instructional plans are ineffective if they are managed inappropriately. There are many information sources a teacher can use to understand student progress. Student grades, the amount of time they spend on a task, the number of times they use classroom resources, content of answers, and general interest level uh, are all tools a teacher can use to gather information on goal progress. Teachers can use time management tools like calendars and computers to lay out a curricular plan. They can use journals and notebooks to d detail specifics regarding plan uh, implementation. Goals need to have a clear criteria by which success can be judged. This might be prob uh, programmatic, like how well a particular plan works within the mission of the department's curricular plan. Curriculum plan, I'm sorry. With careful attention to these elements, teachers can help ensure that the goals and the objectives lead to success. Teachers need to make decisions about what topics uh, meet curricular goals and can be appropriately covered in the title a lot and the time allotted. <laughs> the title allotted. Some decisions may be made uh, at the department, school, or district level.
teachers will always be responsible for making the everyday decisions about how to present content. Thus, they have an inherent responsibility for topic decisions about how to present content choices. Teachers prioritize the information in the field. This allows them to determine which topics provide broad exposure, which are learned in detail, and which are summarized as fundamental concepts. This organizes the information for the teacher and the student. Once teachers determine what topics to cover and in uh, what depth, they next need to develop a specific lesson plan. Lesson plans are guides to aid uh, teachers during instruction. Lesson plans are not prescriptions that have to be followed exactly. They are roadmaps that guide teachers toward particular learning outcomes. There may be multiple routes to the same outcome, and each situation may necessitate a slightly different path. Lesson plans vary dramatically from person to person. Beginning teachers frequently develop very detailed lesson plans. Teachers should not assume that all students learn at the same pace and benefit from the same instruction. As a part of their lesson plan development, uh, teachers should plan for this reality. Some students will need alternative forms of instruction to understand and grow. Others will quickly grasp the lesson and be ready for additional enrichment activities. Teachers should prepare to meet all these learning needs. There are many advantages to approaching education from an interdisciplinary perspective. This philosophy also applies to specific lesson plans. There are many opportunities for teachers to coordinate instruction with colleagues. Learning in real life is not isolated or removed from the everyday act of living. Learning is contextualized in the rich facets of a dynamic, ongoing life. The nature of the context helps to shape and guide learning in unique ways. The same is true for learning in traditional education settings. The personal qualities of the teacher are sometimes overlooked or underappreciated as an element of the educational uh, environment. Teachers are all unique individuals and their differences affect learning. Some teachers have excellent knowledge of their content area, but encounter difficulty when engaging students to, be, to learn because of their organizational abilities. Some teachers are naturally outgoing charismatic individuals who easily capture the attention of the students, but may fail to establish appropriate levels of expectation. The result is that although students enjoy the class, they may not learn up to their ability. Teacher qualities are relevant and important aspects of education. It almost seems unnecessary to say that good teachers have a well-developed knowledge of their subject area. Well-developed content knowledge certainly appears to be a major focus of teacher certification programs and state-federal guidelines for teacher certification. Schools receive federal funding must demonstrate that teachers are highly qualified in the subjects that they teach. States vary in how they make this determination, but it is typically based on a combination of education, experience, and professional development. There is also some evidence that in math courses taught by teachers with the most math coursework, students attain higher levels of achievement. And I've talked about that before. There is growing concern that we are so heavily focused on content expertise that we are forgetting teachers also must be able to teach. One study surveyed principals regarding this issue and found that there is a strong perception that instructor ineffectiveness is caused by a lack of instructional expertise, not content knowledge. The study noted that problems with classroom management, lesson implementation, and student rapport were more significant concerns than content knowledge. It is likely that both content knowledge and instructional knowledge 
factor into teacher effectiveness. Organizational ability is an important part of teaching. It impacts the way teachers relate to their students. Students enjoy organized lessons and benefit from the clarity that makes uh, that comes from well-developed lessons. Spending the necessary time to organize a lesson helps teachers clarify for themselves the important elements of the lesson. This in turn leads to a clearer presentation of the material. Giving students vague or ill-defined lessons creates confusion and less engagement. The other important aspect of being an organized teacher is that it helps support positive interactions with other teachers and administrators. Teachers who appear organized are more likely to be seen as leaders and effective educational professionals. What begins as an expectation from the teacher begins a cycle of action and reaction that supports continuation of the initial expectation. This has often been referred to as a self-fulfilling prophecy. This means that what the teacher initially expects is reinforced and becomes a reality. A related issue is the sustaining expectation effect. This effect occurs when a teacher initially creates an accurate expectation for a student uh, behavior or achievement, but fails to adjust that expectation if the student begins to perform contrary to the expectation. Self-regulated learning is self-directed process by which learners transform their mental abilities into academic skills. It is more than a simple academic skill. It refers to the collective group of self-generated thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that orient an individual toward a goal. Developing self-regulation is important because it sets the stage for becoming an effective lifelong learner. During the school years, a teacher may be able to externally regulate environmental factors to achieve some of these outcomes. Technology has created dramatic shifts in the way that we work and play. Teachers are using technology to improve understanding and academic achievement. Technology is altering the very nature of inquiry and the learning process. Never has so much information been readily available to students and teachers. The communication improvements ushered in by the technological revolutions like email, chat, cellular communications, and synchronous video conferencing are breaking down geographical barriers and connecting people like never before. Most researchers recognize that these changes are going to necessitate some sort of educational response. This response is likely to be ongoing, but initial efforts attempt to bring structure to the educational response by providing standards. Technology in schools has become increasingly integral to the educational process, especially considering the evolving digital landscape and the need for digital literacy among students. This is leading schools to increasingly focus on teaching students to be responsible digital citizens, which involves understanding online safety, privacy, and the ethical use of information and technology. Technology enables personalized learning experiences where instruction is tailored to, the, to meet individual student needs. This can include adaptive learning software, online resources, and the use of data analytics to track student progress. Technology also facilitates collaboration among students, both within and beyond the classroom. Tools like educational social media uh, platforms, online discussion forums, and collaborative project management applications allow for interactive and cooperative learning experiences. Schools are not just integrating uh, technology in computer science classes, but across all subjects through interactive whiteboards, digital textbooks, and online resources. Technology is also revolutionizing assessment methods with tools that provide immediate feedback, digital portfolios, and online assessments. 
These help educators track student progress more effectively. Technology is also used to make learning more accessible and inclusive. This includes assistive technologies for students with disabilities and the use of multimedia content catering to different learning needs. Through technology, students have opportunities to connect with peers and experts worldwide, participating in virtual exchange programs and accessing global learning resources, preparing them to be active participants in a worldwide community. Assigning homework is a common practice in education with the goal of helping students improve their academic performance and develop their academic performance and develop essential study skills. <laughs> homework can reinforce what has been taught in the class, helping students to consolidate new knowledge and skills. Cooper reported that there was clear evidence that homework had substantial uh, positive effects on the achievement of high school students. The effects on junior high students were also beneficial, but only by about half as much. The findings related to elementary school students showed that homework's uh, effect on achievement was trivial. It is just as important to recognize, support, and encourage homework coming from home with the student. This reinforces a cycle of connecting schoolwork with content application and relevancy to the students' everyday experiences at home. A benefit from assigning homework is the opportunity for parents to engage with their child's learning. Well-designed homework assignments that involve family members can have a positive impact on the student learning. Teachers can use homework to provide tasks that cater to an individual student's needs. Excessive homework can lead to student stress, burnout, and negative attitude towards learning. Excessive homework was associated with high stress levels and physical health problems in students. Homework may also exacerbate educational inequalities. Students from disadvantaged backgrounds may not have access to the necessary resources or support at home to produce successful homework. Homework can widen the achievement gap between affluent and less affluent students. Excessive homework can also limit students' time for extracurricular activities, family engagement, and rest. Too much homework can negatively impact children's well-being and family relationships. The, correct, the correlation between homework and academic achievement is weaker for younger students than for older students' uh, than for, than for their older students. Learning in cooperation with peers and teachers requires an ability to socially negotiate the often challenging dynamics of work, of group work. It necessitates that students frame cooperation in a positive way. All too often, students in traditional school settings interact at, in competitive and negative ways. Negative interdependence refers to social processes that are competitive and operate at the expense of others. An alternative approach uses cooperative groups that emphasize positive social interactions. Positive interdependence refers to positive qualities that come out of the effective group work. Groups that work together to achieve a goal rely on each other to succeed. The success of the group is dependent upon productive interactions between group members. In this context, interdependence is framed in a positive way as students strive to work collaboratively in, uh, to produce desirable results. There, is several, there are several basic processes underlying cooperative work. Cooperative learning is where groups of individuals work together to achieve a common goal. Using this approach has proven to have a positive impact on many facets of educational life. Cooperative learning has a positive impact on the level of cooperation students exhibit. Students working in cooperative groups tend to exhibit stronger verbal and nonverbal skills. They also demonstrate less competitive behaviors. 
Another positive outcome of cooperative learning is greater tolerance for diversity. Another area consistently researched is the impact of cooperative tasks on academic achievement. Uh, it's for, uh, <laughs> on academic achievement. Studies on cooperative tasks on academic achievement overwhelmingly support the positive impact of cooperative learning on academic achievement across many grades, subjects, and countries. None of the studies showed negative effects. There is also some evidence that, that experience with cooperative learning is related to higher levels of self-esteem but it is less conclusive. Working in cooperative groups is quite natural for students. Children and young adults spend much of their time socializing in groups, and thus engaging in an academically oriented social task is far from novel. They may need guidance to increase efficiency. The jigsaw approach helps students achieve a given academic task by structuring what each student will be doing. The, this division of labor approach can be used to assign students roles they are comfortable with or can also be used as an opportunity to help students develop new social skills, putting them in novel roles. One of the information processing approaches to learning centers on the, the student address on the student addressing a specific question or line of inquiry. Teachers often use this approach in the sciences because the model closely follows classical uh, classic uh, scientific reasoning. The approach can be modified to any subject matter. The premise of the approach is that there is a question the students must answer. Sometimes the teacher is very active in guiding the student through the inquiry process. Other times are unguided as students work independently. The first step is to recognize there is a problem that is unsolved. Sometimes the teacher will frame the material for the student in this way. The teacher encourages the students to solve problems in an independent way as they come up in daily life. Once the problem is recognized, the student then develops a guess or hypothesis about what the solution or outcome to the problem will be. The hypothesis should be testable. This means the student should be able to assess the merits of the hypothesis through investigation. The students must devise an investigation or experiment, and then they collect data. This is followed by reflection on the data collected and whether or not it supports the hypothesis. Depending on the outcome of the data, the student comes to a conclusion regarding their understanding of the initial problem. Sometimes a student will need to repeat the investigation to confirm preliminary results or will need to re redesign the method of investigation to better assess the original problem. This approach is an excellent technique to help students learn through inquiry. Problem-based learning is a student-centered technique based on constructivist principles that typically uh, help students use self-directed group-based learning to work through real-life open-ended problems. It encourages the basic tenets of inquiry. Additionally, it presents problems in real-world context. This means that the problems are inherently meaningful to the students because they are derived from the problems in everyday life. The problems investigated under this approach are also complex in the sense that they mirror the complexity inherent in real life. They are not scaled down issues presented in a simplified way to ease understanding. They are comprehensive and challenging and ultimately help students learn to solve a uh, problem uh, to solve to problem solve in better ways in their life. <laughs> Behaviorists have long-standing history in psychology and education. Their theories have guided much of public thinking about psychology and research for decades. Their success is due in large part to the clarity of their theories brought to our thinking about human behavior. Behavioral theories moved us away from hidden unconscious processes 
and focused on behavioral explanations that were observable. This gave the appearance of greater scientific objectivity and helped parents and schools alike adopt behavioral principles. The behaviorist movement began to lose its preeminence toward the end of the 1960s when psychologists and educators began to focus on more internal processes like a child's wants and needs and how children process information. Despite this movement away from a strong focus on behavioral theories, they still play a significant role in our schools. There are many instructional models that are derived from the principles of behaviorism. We will examine two of the most prominent direct instruction and mastery le uh, learning. Direct instruction is a systematic, highly structured, teacher-centered form of instruction. It involves basic reinforcement principles of behavioral theory and is used for a variety of subjects and skill areas. DI approaches uh, to learning are typically characterized by two principles. First, the instruction is designed to be explicit, leading to a single interpretation of the material. Second, information is presented in a systematic fashion so that new learning builds on prior learning, reinforcing the prior learned material. DI is often used to support the development of reading, math, computation, and grammar rules. These basic skills respond well to the structured nature of the approach. Phase 1, orientation. The teacher establishes content of the lesson. Teachers reviews uh, previous learning. Teacher establishes lesson objectives. Teacher establishes the procedures for the lesson. Phase 2, presentation. The teacher explains, demonstrates new concepts or skills. Teacher provides visual representation of the task. Teacher checks for understanding. Phase three, structured practices. Teacher leads group through practice uh, examples in lockstep. Students respond to questions. Teacher provides corrective feedback for errors and reinforces correct practice. Phase four, guided practice. Students practice semi-independently. Teacher circulates monitoring student activity. I'm sorry, student practice. Uh, teacher provides feedback through praise, prompts, and appropriate correctives. Mastery learning is an approach to instruction built on the idea that given enough time and proper instruction, nearly all students can successfully master instructional objectives. Mastery learning approaches typically uh, have the following qualities in common. One, instructional objectives are presented to the student in a clear, coherent manner. Two, the learning path for the specific lesson is divided into small, manageable learning units. Each unit has specific ob ob objectives and is assessed to determine appropriate levels of mastery. The following are used as needed to reach mastery. Development of a new teaching method modeling, reteaching, formative and sum, uh, summative evaluations, re and reinforcement. Assessments three assessments are used to guide the learning path, formative, and to determine mastery, summative. Mastery learning is an important instructional technique, particularly for those skills for, uh, that serve as foundation for future learning. It establishes a firm foundation from which students can continue to learn and grow. It is also important for the teacher and necessitates the teacher carefully thinking about the learning process for each student. The teacher must be active with instruction and sensitive to the unique learning needs of each student. Despite these advantages, mastery learning is still not widely used. It can be difficult for a teacher to develop the necessary learning materials to teach a wide variety of students to mastery. It is also difficult because schools demand that teachers adhere to a rigid instructional schedule. This makes it challenging for teachers to give struggling students the necessary time to, uh, to mastery. 
Equity instruction strives to educate students in a way that is sensitive to their unique qualities. It is instruction differentiated according to gender, socioeconomic, and cultural qualities. It reflects the idea that one educational approach will af effectively support the development of all students and affirms the idea that it is through an appreciation of the individual that maximal learning occurs. Research in this area is often controversial and hotly debated. There are many studies supporting differences in education between boys and girls, ethnic groups, and family structure. Universal Design for Learning is a relatively new instructional approach designed to open curriculum instruction to the widest possible audience. UDL is described as a method for eliminating barriers to learning through initial designs that consider the needs of diverse learners. This method is engineered for flexibility and design to anticipate the need for alternatives, options, and adaptations to meet the challenge of teaching to a diverse student body. The technique has critical features like emphasizing the big idea, clarifying essential relationships, providing graduated scaffolds for practice, modeling expert performance, and guiding the mentoring of um, and guiding and mentoring the student. The three principles of UDL, providing multiple means of representation, multiple means of action and expression, and multiple means of engagement. These principles can be applied to post-secondary education, such as providing multiple formats for course materials, allowing for flexible assignments and assessments, and flexible assignments uh, and creating a supportive and inclusive learning environment. The first principle of UDL is multiple means of representation. This principle emphasizes the importance of presenting information in multiple formats to accommodate different learning styles and preferences. This can include providing text, audio, and visual materials, as well as using different modes of pr presentation, such as lectures, discussions, and hands-on activities. They are also useful for students for whom their unique profile of strengths and weaknesses make some information more or less accessible than others. Students who come from atypical backgrounds in the dominant language, cognitive strategies, culture, or history of the average classroom may face barriers in assessing uh, information that assumes a common background for all students. The first principle of UDL ensures that teaching highlights critical features, emphasizes big ideas, connects new information to background information, and models inquiry in order to, access, uh, to be accessible to all students. The second principle of UDL is multiple means of action and expression. This principle focuses on providing students with multiple ways to demonstrate their knowledge and skills. This can include offering flexible assignments and assessments, allowing for different modes of expression, such as written, oral, or visual, and providing tools and te technologies to support student learning. Some students have motor disabilities, which limits their responsive uh, abilities. Other students lack the ability to integrate action into skills. Skill other students lack still... <laughs> Other students lack the strategic and organizational abilities required to achieve long-term goals. Students may need a range of expressive options to be successful, such as review uh, sessions, opportunities for feedback on projects, and optional readings that address different levels of, of prior knowledge. The third principle of UDL is multiple means of engagement. This principle emphasizes the importance of creating a supportive and inclusive learning environment that motivates and engages all students. This can include providing opportunities for collaboration and interaction, offering choices and options in learning activities, and creating a positive and respective classroom culture. Students vary in what engages them in academic work. Students with ADHD 
thrive on spontaneity and novelty, but students actively move away from learning tasks characterized by these qualities. Some students are engaged by risk and challenge, whereas others are not, seeking safety and support. This principle of UDL underscores that different students will respond differently to extrinsic reinforcers, developing a unique path to becoming intrinsic motiv intrinsically motivated. A dimension of difference addressed by individual difference instructional approaches is cognitive or learning ability. <clears throat> it is clear to any teacher that students vary in their capacity to learn new material and benefit from instruction. What is important is that teachers approach instruction with the fundamental belief that everyone can learn. Teaching from this model necessitates acknowledgement that not all students learn best in all environments. Some students will need a particular learning approach to understand the material, Learning styles instruction it focuses on the interaction between learner and uh, learner characteristics and the specific learning task. Research shows that teaching according to preferred learning style can positively impact attitude toward the subject. And that is the end of the lecture. So next week is the last lecture, uh, chapter 15. And happy Thanksgiving.